40 years ago, superheroes like Spider-Man, Superman and Batman invaded Britain from the USA. While we had the Bash Street Kids and Desperate Dan, these exotic Marvelmen were brash, action-packed and very definitely American. But the tables are now turning and a young band of British writers and artists are making a dramatic impression on the action comic scene in America. Opening shot looks at how they are rapidly becoming a cult. The perfect formula is to take fantasy and make it seem as though it could really happen, as though it's real. So one way to give a thing reality was is to establish it in a real place. I always wondered why they called uh, Batman's home Gotham City and Superman Metropolis. I mean, why didn't they say San Francisco or Chicago? So the reason I picked New York was very simple. It's because I lived in New York and I was able to write about New York easier and more accurately than I could have written about another city that I wasn't familiar with. Boy, this is the life. No stoplights, no traffic jams, no trouble. Uh-oh, that sounded like someone breaking into the museum. New York also is the best city you could get just for the visuals, for the artwork, because you've got everything. You've got huge skyscrapers, you have subways. Years ago, we even had elevator trains. You have the docks, the piers, anything you want to draw. Any background you want, you can find a reason to use it in New York. It seems that America has a habit of spreading. I mean, everything that starts out in America seems to, good or bad, seems to spread to not just England or Europe, but pro eventually probably the entire world. And I think comics are no exception. Captain America for three years for uh, for US Marvel and during the time that I was doing that uh, I worked on very many of their other ma major characters so I, I knew that their lineup very well and when I had the chance to uh, come to Marvel UK it was very exciting because it gave me the chance to harness the British talent which had been finding its own way to the American industry during the time that I was there When we began to make comics uh, under our new Marvel UK uh, logo, we first put out just one comic, which was Death's Head, and that was an enormous success. It, it sold over 300,000 copies. And uh, after that, we released uh, five comic books. And the content of the comic books was very different from the American Marvel comics of the time. Uh, we put uh, a great deal of emphasis on strong female characters, uh, we included New Age philosophy rather than straight superheroes, so there's a big difference there. My guess is that the Americans are a bit bemused by it, but um, they, they're very happy because we're introducing uh, some new themes to them in terms of our approach. And in the American market alone, we've got 5% of the American market share. We've arranged to ship most of Marvel UK's titanic new titles to your favorite comic book stores in America. No longer shall we underprivileged colonials be deprived of the mother country's harvest of heroes. I think British comics are becoming a bit of a cult in the States. They're very interested in our approach. It's slightly more cynical, slightly more gritty than, than their own approach. I guess the interest in British comics really started with uh, two things, Judge Dredd, which was published in 2000 AD, and Warrior Magazine. 
Uh, Judge Dredd started being published here by a company called Quality somewhere in the mid-80s and has always had a real cult following in the United States. It was very different than anything anyone had seen before. Death's Head from Marvel UK was uh, one of the first titles to really break through to the superhero audience from the UK. It features a really big, scary, robot kind of guy who tra travels through time and beats people up a lot <laughs> and is, uh, was very different from the classic tights and cape genre. And they really were telling comic book stories in a way different than a lot of other creators had. It's sort of, you know, a lot, instead of seeing the same old thing, people were seeing something really new and really refreshing. I like the way they showed Gore in the, the thing. Like, sometimes they'll show half a head going flying with the trap behind it, which is pretty cool. I noticed that Marvel UK started having some interesting comics. So I picked them up and, um, let's see, like this one, Dark Angel, okay? Um, I really like this one and uh, the storyline really holds together well. The UK appeals more to me because it's a more mature approach. The artwork and the storylines tend to be more sophisticated. And that might have more to do with my age than anything else, you know. I've heard of the Spider-Man uh, comics from Britain. Unfortunately, they sold out so quickly, I was at the loss to get some, and I feel really bad about that because that's a true collector's because it's so, when it sells out that quick, it becomes rare very quickly. It can sell for $2.50 and within a week go up to $75. I definitely see a connection to the British punk movement. There's a magazine called Deadline, which comes out. The characters tend to be very punk. The, the music they talk about tends to be very hardcore punk. I've definitely noticed a cyberpunk influence, a, a sort of uh, making yourself better through machinery and prosthetics and... Um, where superheroes in the past were, I'm going to make myself better through training and dedication and this kind of, you know, my parents were killed, so I'm going to become the best I could be to avenge their death. But this is more like about being disassociated from the, 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 the corporal body and becoming, building on it and adding swords and guns into your arms and, and you know, like these, these eyepieces. And I also see a lot of uh, more occultish influences, too. There seems to be, you know, dark secret societies and... And that kind of stuff. I, it just, it's definitely a lot different. Judge Dredd was, you know, post-apocalyptic futures, and they seem to be a lot more willing to let characters die than in the Marvel title, you know, the regular superhero titles. There seems to be more of a, just kind of an abandon to the books. The British approach is much more cynical, I would say. There's much more of an interest in robots, cyborgs. Uh, they don't really seem to have much of a nostalgia or, or a, a tolerance for the mainstream, what you might call, capes and boots superheroes. Well, I work on Death's Head, and uh, that's obviously been extremely successful in America, much to everyone's surprise and, and also uh, pleasure. <laughs> I have to say, it took me by complete surprise, but uh, I'm, I'm glad it went down so well. I think the UK writers tell a lot more uh, of character in their story. They have a lot more story there. They don't rely on the punching and the fights as much. The American stuff's always been very action-packed. It's a lot of splash pages, big figures jumping out at you, and, and we've gone for that as well. But there's also I think a certain amount of grit to the English products that are lacking in some of the titles in America. What I'm doing now is a much more European looking book in the sense that it's much more rendered, it's much more illustrative. So I think it's important to, to make the readers feel like they can believe in this character. We really have these big muscular <laughs> guys in the books punching each other and the, the UK artists seem to have, while the, the, the characters are massive and in scope, they're not as steroided out as a lot of the American ones. Out of my way, insect. Traditionally, comic book artists have worked from their own homes and brought their work in when it's completed. But about 18 months ago, uh, we decided here to start uh, an art room downstairs where the artists could come in and work actually on the premises. 
can't remember the first time I picked up a pencil, but uh, I do remember I was drawing comics first, I think, before anything else. I started reading uh, Beano comics and Dandy comics, which were given to me by my mum and dad, which they, they tend to be the comics which kids are bought. Uh, by their parents, which were, which were great when you're very young and progressed from that to American comics. Conan was a big favourite in the early 70s, but then I, as I got a bit older, I got much more into the European angle of things, which is a totally different market altogether. It's much more adult orientated and it's taken quite seriously, which I think was uh, just an excuse for carrying on reading comics whenever I stopped. You know. I was always, always drawing uh, when I was a kid anyway. It was my major pastime. I spent all, all the time either watching cartoons or drawing or doing both at the same time, most if I could. And, uh, and with the comics, the comics just made me want to draw even more. For me, they equate very much with films, and they've got the same sort of uh, connection in so much as if you go and see a good action movie, you'll, you'll be lost for an hour and a half in, in, that, in that world. A good comic will do that. You'll read it, and you'll, you'll be there. When you start from scratch, the white page can be really daunting, so it is a case of picking your big image and, and going for that. We start off with a rough layout page, which I, I then take the whole distance. When it's... When I've finished with the pencils, this will then go on to the inker. In its simplest form, an inker will go over the pencil outline in, in ink and prepare the artwork uh, for camera uh, so that it, and print. In doing that, the inker interprets what the, the pencil artist has put down and uh, hopefully will add a final sheen and polish to the whole job. In fact, the whole process is very organic, from plot to drawing back to the writer so he can put the words in and, and he, he put the sound effects in. And then it goes to a letterer who will put all your words in, will make all the balloons kind of flow with the page. And then the anchor gets it and he finishes it off. Then the colorist gets it and then they add the color and you've got a comic book. It, the possibilities are endless. It's like making a film. It's exactly like making a film. Definitely one of the differences is that we have modern bodybuilding going on now, which has taken it to a whole new level in terms of understanding the dynamics of the human figure. In the 50s, you've got people like Steve Reeves and Charles Atlas who had a completely different physique to someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, which he, he's a big bloke, but he's also got no fat on him. You can see how every, every muscle is working. Basically, these are, these are quite helpful because you get, you get an idea in your head and maybe you can position the action man, approximate the position with the action man and then sort of turn him around and get a different different angle on the thing. And um, it just helps the imagination a little bit. To become a comic book artist is not all that difficult if you're incredibly talented, because all you've got to do is make up a few sample pages and send those drawings into the editor. We are always looking for good new artists. I, I emphasize good. I cannot tell you how many submissions we get that are so incredibly bad and so amateurish and so awkward. And I say to myself, how can this person even hope to be an artist? Well, what I'd say to anyone who wanted to get into the business is don't be afraid of copying, because that's, how what, I, that's what I did. I gotta be more careful of what I say. It's very important to, to understand what what the artists are doing when they draw a page. And the only way you can do it is by, by doing that, because there's so many lessons you can learn by doing that. Good, good advice is, if you enjoy it, stick at it, persevere. Years ago, a comic book artist would hope, some, some of them at any rate, to move on to become advertising artists. That paid more money. Or magazine illustrators. That paid more money. 
Today, there are almost no art fields at all that pay more or even as much as a good comic book artist can earn. Over the last 10 years, I think the lot of the artists is, is an awful lot better than it was. If you sell over 50,000 copies, you get a, a royalty and a percentage on, on every copy after that, which was completely new. That didn't happen before. I love the fact that today, artists and writers and editors, perhaps even some publishers, have attained superstar status amongst the fans. Yeah, we get a lot of very positive positive letters from America, it's, it's great. It's, uh, obviously, they're the people who read it, and, and they're your audience, and they're the ones you've got to thank for it all, really. I am so happy to see that this thing has grown and evolved, and now when I go to a comic book convention and I see people lined up, they're lined up around the block for their favorite artist's autographs. Gosh, I wish I'd brought my autograph book. So many people who have comic book conventions will take ads in newspapers and other magazines on the radio and television and announce that so-and-so is going to be there to make a speech or to sign autographs. That's what's so nice about going to a convention and doing a signing and being able to talk to the people who buy it. It's essentially they're getting their, all their fan letters <laughs> mentioned in person. Sorry, folks, no time for autographs, uh, but you may applaud if you wish. That's wonderful. It, it makes it, it makes comics become as viable a field as movies, television, or anything of that sort. De definitely, there's a, a buzz about it, and the artwork being collectible. It's nice. It's nice to know that issue one of Death is like worth uh, what the last last issue sold for thirty five dollars in San Diego. It's quite nice. I'm not going to complain about that. The artwork that we do gets returned to us, and then we can sell it through a dealer or by ourselves at a convention, or we can retain it if, we, if we'd like. Brian Bolland, an English illustrator who worked on Batman, uh, sold a page of The Killing Joke for, well, reportedly for 700 pound. Uh, that's on top of what he was paid for it originally. There are a number of female writers and artists, but they certainly are in the minority. It's always been a male-oriented sort of thing, I think, and from, from the early days of comics, it's been, the, the storylines have always been, like, very macho, and the, the heroes have been, like, Batman and all male characters, but, I mean, I, I think nowadays it's a lot, a lot more of the lead characters are women, and they're just as strong and sort of intelligent as, you know, the men. Now we meet Storm, whose mutant ability to control weather itself is still not completely understood. There's a sort of a mythology in the industry that women can't do the kind of things men can do. They can't draw punches, they can't draw sexy women, they can't draw perspective, they can't draw whatever. They can't draw large hands. Uh, it's, it's just that mythology. It, women can draw anything a man can draw. Forget it, lady. I'd like to think that as a woman, I have a different perspective to offer to the comic book industry. I can understand why women wouldn't read comics or women, women wouldn't be interested in getting into the comic book industry. I know why I enjoy it. Um, it's just a wonderful creative process to get involved in. Well, this cover was one that I had to really beg my editor to do. My editor at the time was also a woman editor. And um, she really liked to see a lot more action on the covers because action attracts kids to the books. But I felt with this story, it wasn't that kind of a story. It was a story about two characters struggling um, to come to terms with a war and with some of the things that had happened to them. And I felt that it would appeal to some of the readers because it was minimal. And it, it was just maybe powerful in its, in its being quiet. And uh, a lot of the female readers responded very favorably to this cover. I do like to think that the women characters in my books are a little bit more assertive, a little bit more forceful, possibly a little bit more intelligent. If I, if I find a writer wanting to portray a woman in, in a way I think that's negative, I can at least say, please, you know, consider, reconsider, do it this way. Magneto, your deliverance is at hand! Well, my friends, they, I, I've talked to them about this and they say, oh, well, I don't like the way women are portrayed and they're all really very busty and curvaceous and lovely and stuff. And it's like, yeah, well, but so are the men, so, you know, you can't really argue that. Okay, this figure's um, sort of inspired by one of the characters from the X-Men. 
called Deathbird, I think her name was. Um, I really liked the sort of the costume she was wearing. It's, it was very spiky and armoured and she's a bit crazy, this character. So A lot of women think that um, it is the same as it was years ago and when women are damsels in distress and only get, get rescued by the, by the male characters. But, I mean, it's not so anymore. If you translate a comic book to a motion picture, you're going to gain something that the motion picture has to offer that you can't put in a comic, and you're going to lose something that a comic book can do that you just can't do in a motion picture. In the case of our comics being produced as video games, you gain a lot and you lose a lot. You gain a lot of exciting visuals. Of course, you lose a lot of story. You can't have the same kind of story in a video game that you have in a comic book. Uh, when you're reading a comic, the, the story has already been set, and it's, it's almost as if a reporter is telling the story of what happened. It's almost a newsreel, whereas with a, with a, a computer game, you're setting that story, you're making history. Um, you know, you can play Spider-Man, you can make a move around, and no two games will ever be the same. You're trying to balance your freedom on the computer to make it do all sorts of fantastic things. You can't have you know, Spider-Man doing things he doesn't do in his comic. You know, you couldn't undress him. You know, it's pretty exciting what's going to happen in the future. Um, as regards to virtual reality, uh, interacting with you know, the character itself. You could wear a Spider-Man suit and you could move around and as you're moving. Um, you'd look extremely bizarre doing it if somebody was watching you. You'd have this mask on it and you would see uh, what Spider-Man was doing. You'd move around, it'd be amazing. Uh, and that technology isn't too far away, I'd say before the end of the decade anyway. The reason why there are a lot of British programmers and in fact a lot in the Northwest, um, is the reason why it's it may be because it's, it's quite rainy in the northwest and people stay inside a lot more. I mean, and you have to do something, so you, you tend to find people will, will get a computer and, and learn to program. Whereas if you're in sunny California, the last thing you're going to do is sit inside and program a game. You're going to be, you'd be better at surfing. I think people never outgrow their love of fairy tales or of that type of story. If you think about it, there is no place else where you can get what I would refer to as fairy tales for grown-ups other than in comics, in superhero comics, because it's the same thing. You have people with superpowers. You have stories that involve fantasy, the supernatural, and yet they're stories about real, living people, flesh and blood people who live in today's world for the most part, so I feel that today's comics, to sum it up, are like fairy tales for grown-ups. The final opening shot next Saturday profiles the latest production from the National Youth Music Theatre and follows the work of the musicians who visit schools to encourage the next generation. That's next Saturday at 6.30.